Come with us on a journey into the unknown, the unexplained, and the unbelievable. We will test your senses and challenge your beliefs. A world where science and religion clash. Or do they? You will meet real people and hear real stories, but you will not believe. You will witness strange sights and hear strange sounds, but you will not believe. This is the New England Ghost Project. Welcome to the Nightmare. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ghost Chronicles Next Generation. I am your host, the blonde bombshell herself, or rather by herself, because Van Helsing can't be with us this evening, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. Nah, I'm just kidding. You guys know I'd be lost without Ron. Since we're still not shooting shows in the EB Camp studio, we're bringing you tonight a special presentation from Spirit Quest 2019. The guys from New 4, the New England UFO Reporting Center, Greg and Joe, are back by popular demand with a case of high strangeness that they investigated back in the 90s in Sudbury, Massachusetts. It has a little bit of everything paranormal, ghosts, possible time slips, aliens, apparitions. It's really got it all, but I'll leave it to them to fill you in on the particulars. I'll see you back at the halfway mark for a little cemetery tripping. And until then, please sit back and enjoy the show. I'd like to uh, thank uh, our guys. They were here last year. They were such fabulous that uh, people wanted them back. Yay. So uh, they're back. Yeah. Anyways, they are the guys from uh, New Four. New Four. And this is uh, Joe and Greg. Oh, well, it's on yet. Good. This is uh, Joe <laughs> Camperita and uh, Greg. Berghorn. Berghorn. Yeah. I was going to say big horn, but that works. <laughs> and uh, they're going to talk about a, a case that uh, you guys actually worked on too. We did. So uh, this should be a really fun and interesting thing, unlike mine. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. So I just want to begin by thanking you for coming this morning. We were here last year. We had a great time. We hope you guys had fun too. We talked about UFOs and the cases we've investigated over the years in general last year. And while we were talking about stuff in general, we mentioned a case that occurred in Sudbury back in the 90s, which we investigated. And we said to Ron, we could come back this year and talk about just that case because it's a huge one from our point of view. And I think you'll find that it's got all kinds of unusual aspects to it. We think it's sort of like a UFO case, sort of paranormal, and sort of something else which I'm calling ceremonial time. And you'll see later what I'm talking about because a lot of amazing things happened in this one spot here in Massachusetts, in Sudbury. Once again, I'm Greg Burkhorn. I'm the, the head of New Four, the New, the New England UFO Reporting Center. We've had, changed our name a couple times. We've been around since the 70s. So we have many years of experience, thousands of cases we've dis, uh, investigated, many of them right around here, and, and this one in particular in Sudbury. This is Joe Cambria, and Joe uh, is, he was actually the head of the organization back then when we investigated this case. So we keep trading it back and forth. When Greg said we get, uh, we've looked at a thousand cases, a lot of them are just worthy of a phone call and a follow-up, lights in the sky, misinterpretation of space station, comets, whatever it might be. But every now and then, a case falls across the table that you have to follow up on and say, what is going on here? We rate these cases in degrees of high strangeness, strangest to high. This case started off as a traditional alien, UFO, something happened in a suburb, go check it out, and then it had just absolutely exploded into a year and a half investigations and they don't last that long. Generally speaking, because most of the people want to just exit, they don't want to talk about it, it's too emotional, they're afraid, whatever. Uh, this case exploded, and the, the tentacles went to every corner of study that you can imagine. You'll see it as this goes on. But I wanted to keep chronologically the, the events that were taking place so that you get sort of a roadmap of how this happened, what happened to this family, 
there's even history of this family I don't have enough time to, to, to share with you, where they came from in Peabody, Massachusetts, the street they lived on. Oh, the case actually started in June of 1994, where a family uh, was contacted by the Mass MUFON organization, the Mutual UFO Investigation Group, which is an international group at the time. We were part of it. And they were, uh, Mr. Raymond Fowler, who's an author of many, many UFO books, was contacted uh, to follow up on an, an alleged possible alien encounter, close encounter, in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to call the main character Barbara, okay, just to protect the uh, family's identity. Uh, 41 years old, flight attendant, real estate agent, professional, has a four-year-old daughter and is pregnant, about approximately four to five months pregnant with the second child. Uh, her daughter, Alexa, we'll just call her a daughter, woke up from a dream and saw at the foot of her bed, with her arms stretched out, she saw her mother. She went to her mother and her arms went right through her mother. Okay, so that triggers, okay, this is a strange one. The daughter was mad and in the morning told her mom what she was wearing. Mom was wearing regular day clothes and the daughter was not afraid of what took place but was mad at the mom because she wanted a little comfort and a little hug. That's how it started, okay? In uh, <clears throat> late December to January of 1995, December 94 to 95, Ray Fowler, who was handling it, handed it over to myself. I was the state director for MUFON at the time and said, something's here, why don't you go check it out? He didn't have time and he was starting to get into retirement. Uh, Barbara's second child was born approximately November of 1994. Awakes to see, um, awakes the child for a feeding and notice, notices outside this is a massive house. This is a four to five thousand square foot house. Razor thin bars of color outside the house. If we can put that up. Uh, that's okay. So the razor thin bars we're talking about right now, which in a sense uh, formed a perimeter around the house, are right here. Mostly blues and then an orange or melon colored one. So Go. the dots are actually like looking up above down at a, at a bar coming down out of the sky. So imagine them as grids in various places around the house on the property. Yeah, she looked all over and she could see these, could not see the origin of the light, but made notice of it. And uh, this is where we were involved now, okay. Um, and again, we put this together late last night, so hang in there. This was her drawing, wasn't it, Joe? Yeah. yeah. By the way, Barbara's recall and graphic interpretation to the best of her artistic ability, you'll see throughout this case, she actually got items to the inches in the feet, how far away they were. We suspect at the beginning, on the onset of a case, that this could be a hoax. And we always keep that option open, because people need attention, whatever. This wasn't a hoax. As we got into this, her recall was astounding. And like everything, there's a lot more to the story. Well, there was a lot more to Barbara's yeah, story. We kind of raise red flags mm -hmm. if someone's trying to sell a book. So they're trying to talk on the radio. Not that that means that they're not believable, but <laughs> it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Right? Doesn't help. So she woke her husband. You're going to hear me talk a lot about the husband. And um, they viewed the buzz for 10 minutes. Now that's like, you got to be kidding me stuff, right? <clears throat> and the husband said, oh, he's a professional, uh, he's a lawyer. He said, um, must be an MIT experiment in the area. Notice the color of the lights, you see him up on the screen. And they also noticed police cruiser with the lights on driving up and down the adjacent roads with the lights on. Okay, uh, this happened three or four times where the police were doing the perimeter, checking it out. Both went back to bed. Um, but they hadn't, the police hadn't been called, as I recall. No, the police did this on their own. And when we <coughs> would call a police station in those days, they didn't want to talk about 
this, it's just they don't want to get involved. But something had triggered their interest. Exactly. All right, Greg, if you can throw up the next slide. This is the entrance <clears throat> to the property. This is, if you could go back one to the uh, overview. Now, what's interesting about this is you can see this is like 250 acres of wildlife refuge, swamps, wetlands. Anybody, any place would call this unbuildable. And all of a sudden, this monster house is built on it with a dirt road for an access. This thing is huge. And again, you shouldn't be building stuff here. They did. All right, you can go forward. So the dirt road entrance, the next, please. Yeah, I chopped it on mine. There's the, um, there's a swamp. I don't know why it does that. And the next one. It's a River Swamp. Yeah. And swamp gas, right? <laughs> no swamp gas on this one. So anyways, you can see how very, very remote and rural, in a sense, the land is protected, but it's not. Okay, moving forward. Um, show the next one. Yeah, back up. Okay, uh, March to April, 1995. Barbara woke up, sat up, and viewed three beings floating above the bed. One was a large female. She classified it as a large female. I didn't offer any information. And two smaller children. Um, the female who was apparently the in charge of this, whatever was taking place, she classifies it a female alien with Roman soldier outfit on, the metal chest and all the garb, but it was an alien face. You'll see more connection to that as we go on. Late April, 95, she woke up with a jolt. 14 inches from her head is a face. She couldn't speak. The face was human, bluish gray, fine gray hair, combed forward. Gentle face, eyes closed. His mouth, his mouth, wasn't a human mouth. Very thin lip, asked, uh, the event took, lasted 20 seconds. If the next slide should get us something up here, right there. Yeah. Now remember, we're taking it from the point of view of an alien encounter because that's how they approached us. So this doesn't necessarily mean that's this had alien close encounter written all over it, but it was starting to take detours. In late and June 9th to 10th, 1995, Barbara woke up, 1:40 in the morning to, and again her recall was amazing. 1.40 in the morning to view a six-inch square box two feet from the ceiling fan. And she viewed a, a whirlpool of gray light and a black cord wrapped around the fan. Uh, the cord recoils back into this box and slowly ascends and goes through the ceiling. At this point, she feels tingling in her hands and legs and views for each large heads, 12 to 14 inches wide, through the window. Uh, she commands them to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, prays with her rosaries, and then fell asleep. All right, do we have the brain? Oh, by the way, if we go through this series of slides, this is some of the earlier 35 millimeter shots that she took where she saw a light outside of her bedroom window. Next one. It starts to separate. You can see the trees. You can use them as a reference point <coughs> to triangulate. And the next one shows the separation even more. And then the offense start. Next slide. Here's the alien that she saw. Has seen this alien many times. Shows no fear with the alien. So Barbara's either drawn these pictures or taken the pictures. Yeah. The yeah. And again, this, this lady is amazing. Uh, do we have the brain? Uh, the brain is there. Uh, yeah, we, again, we, my, my apologies. Now, here's the brain. This is an interesting one. Um, in a dream, she was at the threshold of a bright, cold room, 70 feet by 100 feet. That's her interpretation of the size of the room. She couldn't see any lights, felt a gentle hand on her back, and the Back, the person behind us said, this is good for you. And this is what your God wants. The Bible was very religious. 
Uh, she sees steel tables in the room, saw humans working. They were shot with brown hair wearing lab coats, very busy, no eye contact. She saw a brain on the wall. And this brain appears many times in this, in this case. The brain was on the wall about 70 feet away. She remembers screaming, no. And then the event came to an end. She wakes with four faces in front of her that pulled back quickly. The next day she felt only that she felt she only slept a few seconds. She was sick to her stomach. Her hair was wet. She felt that this event wasn't the first time it happened. She feels they were aliens and wants to show that their God is stronger. In June 14th, 95, Bob is in a deep, heavy sleep. Thought she felt something in her abdomen. Now at this point, she had had her second child mm -hmm. roughly six months ago. She felt something in her abdomen. It was moving up, down, left, yeah. and right. She put her hands on her abdomen to stop it. Felt she got a good night's sleep, no physical effects. Flash forward to June 27, 95. She woke at 1.40 in the morning. And again, her recall is amazing how she documents all this time. And um, covered the windows with cardboard. The baby woke at roughly 10 minutes to 4 in the morning. Fell asleep. At 4 o'clock, Barbara awoke to see a maroon colored face on the slanted ceiling. She had dark hair. It was a human facial features. Large black or brown eyes looked cold and angry. Had a jeweled headband. It was oval to round shape on the forehead. Her arms and legs tingled. She sat up, looked at the visitor, and the visitor started to pull back through the wall. We were reaching the point now where this was more, there was nothing really in the data to suggest this was alien encounters exclusively. This was starting to take a little detour on us. She needed our support. We hung in there. June 29th, another visitor, a little guy in the hallway, opaque, light gray, glided into the bedroom. The baby cried at about 1.40 a.m., no physical sensations. Her husband slept through the entire event. You're going to hear that often. This guy was good. July 10th, 95. She view, Barbara views, views sparkles and shapes flying around the room, strobe-type gray light, sees a black string. The cord comes down from the ceiling over her daughter. The mother tries to grab the cord. It retracts and never comes back. Next day, June 11th, got a slide, HH, yeah. Another visit at 3.15 in the morning, the baby woke up. She sees two oval-shaped brains in the room. Made her feel good. She fell asleep. The brains were about four to five feet apart from each other, maroon to gray color. She's seen this many times, no fright. Feeling of friendship in the brain. And she said this many times during the case investigation. She felt that the brain was there to protect them, maybe. Uh, also, there were two other people like visitors, gray, no hair. They came with four to five blue-gray Casper-type guides. That's in the data. Uh, they were gone in three to four minutes. July 13th, more visitors and brains. The visitors were gray or maroon colored. The bigger visitor doesn't move. Their hair is soft and moves like they are underwater. There's a humming noise in the background. Strobe-type lights, very active. She felt no fear. July 18th, 95, 4.30 in the morning. She's folding laundry. Her legs and arms get goosebumps. Hair on the legs is standing up. She saw a hazy ball, seam illuminated. Changed colors from gray to orange to blue to green, lasting about five seconds. She had head to toe static feeling after about three minutes. She threw holy water at it. What a girl. It passed right through it. She commanded it to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. It did not leave, and after 20 to 30 minutes, it left. 20 to 30 minutes. That's huge. That evening, everybody slept. Her parents from forward were here, and the parents have a history of visitation also. They all slept in the great room. 
Everybody watched till the TV till 3 a.m. Barbara fell asleep, woke up with her arms and legs kicking, screaming, and found herself at the top of the ceiling looking down at her husband. I'm, sorry, I'm still looking down at her whole family. The husband woke up and screamed, shut up. <laughs> and guess what he did? He fell back asleep. Boy, this guy's good. He's consistent, I'll tell you. you know what? That's what husbands are for. <laughs> <laughs> husbands are very trainable, wow. unlike popular belief. One of the interesting things we've learned over the years with other cases, and maybe here too, is that the principal person involved in the case will be awake, and people around them will be what we call turned off. Like a switch. Now, turned off may be going to sleep. I don't know what happened in this case. So anyways, in conclusion of that date, and I'm going to move pretty quickly because I want to, Craig has a big delivery at the end here. Uh, she fell back asleep. Her daughter was sitting up like a little Indian, make note of the word Indian, with her head tilted to one side. Barbara falls asleep. She wakes up at 5 o'clock to view the brain image, which leaves in five minutes. We don't need that. August 9th, 95. Barbara actually had a chance to look closely at the brain. And again, the recall is amazing on this lady. Had a very small liquid movement inside. Looked like blood plasma. She had no fear. She was just angry. She commanded it to leave, and by the third try, it left through the wall. Robert starts to research the land that her house is on and in, um, take some pictures. I asked her to get 1,000 speed, 35 millimeter at the time, no flash. Try to photograph that with no flash. No digital cameras. <laughs> yeah, that's all we had. Uh, August 17th, 95. Things have been quiet. She took pictures of the brain, not developed yet. Her father, who's still here from Florida, saw four each round blue discs flying around the living room for four minutes at 3.30 in the morning. They all exited through the wall. The father shares with the daughter when he was young. He saw a mothership UFO, and from it, three smaller UFOs emerged from it and formed a pyramid and then shot off in different directions. She also tells me that five nights ago, the grass was tampled, tampled down. And she confronted a masked blob on the back of a tree and was ordered to look inside. And now you can see where this is going away from alien. This is starting to get into other stuff. She ordered it to leave, and a skeleton appeared. We have no idea what that is. August 25th, she had a regressive reception. She's doing well. She moved away for a week to Maine just to get away. And by the way, when she moved away, the events almost didn't happen. When she came back to the house, all hell would break loose again. If I could just interject. When we study cases over the years, hundreds and hundreds of cases, Typically, there isn't this level of detail. Typically, it's a brief encounter with a light in the sky or something happened that took about 30 seconds or less. So there's a relatively small subset of the cases where we have a tremendous amount of information like this and it doesn't necessarily fit together cohesively. Yeah. So, so we're doing our best to describe it to you, but it doesn't... It doesn't all follow step by step through the process, so you'll have to just sort of come with us on this crazy journey. Yeah. Also of note in August, she shared with me that of her six closest girlfriends who had babies, one baby aborted, two were on the pill, all five babies, this is with her second child, were born within six weeks of each other. How significant is that? I don't know. Uh, we have a next slide. Is this the right slide? Yep. Uh, this is September 95. She wakes up early in the morning hearing a medium tone level sound that was continuous. Located the object that was making the sound, the object looked like a hot air balloon. Now what you're going to see is this hot air balloon we're talking about is right here. And I think the next slide might show it, Greg. 
Yeah. There it is. It's on that other picture, but it's off to yeah. the side. Yeah. So that hot air balloon was, I believe, in close proximity to, to the back. baby's crib, please. Yeah. yeah. Right here. And and at this point, the whole family's hunking down in one room, the great room. I mean, they they don't know what to do with this. Uh, the hot air balloon had small checker pattern inside, constantly moving, no glowing. The balloon was next to and touching the baby's playpen. The baby was inside the playpen sleeping unharmed. The balloon started disappearing slowly, felt that this balloon woke her up on purpose to defend or protect her family from a group of, quote, dark energy forces. The balloon was four to six inches across and three feet above the floor, September 11th. Uh, AAA is the, the uh, here we go. September 11th, Barbara wakes at 1.20 in the morning to see the room illuminated in a pinkish orange light. Against the wall is a maroon circle with a great deal of design in the middle, as you can see, all of this stuff. And She's done a pretty good job of graphic things out. The circle starts to roll to the left to exit the room. As I sit up to view this closer, the circle rolling counterclockwise, mm -hmm. this is a great recall, uh, about 10 feet away, exits right through the wall the next day, September 12th. And what's happening here is this case is really starting to build to its peak of the activity that's taking place. Uh, September 12th, she has uh, psychics arrive. As soon as they enter the house, all the alarms go off in the house. And they said that's very common with their study. Uh, one of the psychics asked her husband to enter the living room. They both detected fecal smell, and they identified it as adult, not child. Kids have a fecal smell that's unique if you've had kids. Uh, no diapers were found. Only the psychics could sense the fecal smell. So I just wanted to also mention that we weren't the first people they contacted. They had had Indians come and American, Native Americans come and do yep. a smudge ceremony. They had a priest come, I believe, and do a exorcism. And, uh, and they had uh, psychics come with equipment, which Joe's talking about now. So we were sort of late in the process contacted because they were saying, maybe it's aliens. Well, with that particular date, the psychics came to a summary conclusion that nothing that ever lived there was human. Uh, all lights on, the hot dog. The psychics prayed to Padre Pio. I guess he's a pretty popular guy. Yes. A flash of light, a beam appears on the ceiling while they're praying and under the door, something you'd see on TV. Barbara steps on the light. <laughs> Both lights disappeared simultaneously. Her husband comes home at 10.30. Psychics leave. Another team arrives the next day. Uh, all go outside at 8.30 p.m. Barbara sees these razor-thin purple beams to the left of the house. One of the psychics stands next to the beams, and the beams are all around him, giving him a tingling feeling. Then he walks forward to the drift pot and his voice is in his head saying, quote, come down the path now. They took pictures, nothing showed up with the 1,000 speed 35 millimeter film. September 25th, two teams of psychics show up and a doctor who I believe was a PhD from MIT. And um, they were looking at Barbara's drawings and said the symbols were Mayan, Mayan, Mayan. Very important symbols doctor had just adopted a Mayan child. At 8 p.m., the teams of psychics, two male and two female, go down the path. The field strength meter that the PhD MIT guy brought was just bouncing all over the place. Something was happening. We had no contact with these people, by the way. Um, during the day, they saw purple balls all around the house floating and spinning. During that same evening, they all entered Barbara's closet for some reason and everyone got sick to their stomach. The doctor set up some equipment and detected something on the video camera. More equipment was set up in the bedroom and they stayed into the evening. And what they saw was a form of a man come through the wall. 
and then regressed back into the wall. <coughs> Everybody saw it. All went outside for some fresh air and noticed thousands of small white dots flying every place, almost like bugs that have the lights. Or whatever, you know. They heard a pack of coyotes, <coughs> excuse me, they heard a pack of coyotes crying in the woods. The group went into the house and heard a woman screaming and smelled bananas. That went away, and then they heard banging. The whole group started praying. They tried to communicate by asking for more banging and knocking. Nothing happened. Then a flash of light appears under the door. Not everybody saw it. Then they heard drumming. The drumming is going to come in as Greg does a summary conclusion on this. All four went outside and in the garden they viewed very strong lights in the ground shooting up. Only the psychic saw it. Barbara didn't see it. And, but everybody did experience red, purple, white lights and spinning purple balls all outside. They went inside the house and into the bedroom and the temperature was cold, very cold. Before the group went in the house, they all felt an alien satanic Mayan presence. A few saw a Mayan dressed as a Roman soldier again, metal chest plate, etc. A time riff was mentioned along with the lost city of Atlantis. Lots of disagreement among the four <coughs> psychics. They concluded that the real cause was a lost civilization. Barbara, that evening, has a vision of a blonde girl. All want to come back and do more work. October 2nd, 8 p.m., thousands of soft white golf balls viewed in the living room. A very light blue creamy gel filled the room. The husband could not see it. It lasted five to 10 minutes. Papa felt that the balls were playing and that they were people. That was interesting. She felt no fear. The balls entered and exited through the window. The next visit by the psychic team showed a force field around the house captured by a sensitive photographic equipment they brought along. In the backyard, the equipment picked up by um, ghost gobules that showed as small lights on the film. Again, we have no, no, they didn't give us copies of this. All agreed that the alien, the presence was alien and uh, that the ghosts have taken on the forms of spines and pelvic bones. All felt the ghost, all the psychics felt the ghosts were attracted to Barbara and were landlocked. That'll blend in towards the end. October 5th, a new team arrives. This time an MD, could be a PhD from Hartford, it studies infectious disease. A psychic that studies Mayan culture also adopted four Mayan children. Maybe the same previous psychic, we don't know. Uh, the female members of the group got ill at the entrance to the bedroom. Heavy air, hard to breathe, knees got weak. Four beings appeared outside to the left side of the house with bright lights in the woods 20 feet away, non-human. There was an opening between the aliens and the and the aliens wanted the team to follow them. One team member hears a voice in their head saying, they want us to go into the woods. Only Barbara could see the aliens. One member felt that they were mostly aliens. Something bad, lost lives. The MD felt that a thousand, thousands of lives were lost on this path. That'll blend in at the end. All felt that it started off as aliens. Uh, Going to October 20th, uh, the one particular road abuts where she lives. They found a rock in the weeds, and on the rock, which is on another person's property, adjacent property, chiseled into the rock. In the 1700s, soldiers used this field to store guns and ammunition. A four-day massacre took place in 1630, April 19th to the 22nd, between the King Philip's Indians, the Massasoit, and the settlers. All are buried in this spot. Many towns involved. Sleeping Indian village attacked. People were scalped. Books are written on it. Did you want to comment on this? So later on, I'm going to be talking about this in depth because there's a lot more going on here. Oh yeah. We need to describe. But I'll fast forward. If you're not confused yet. <laughs> sure to, the the ending pulls this thing together. How high degree of strangeness this case was. So what do you think about this case so far? It's pretty amazing, huh? 
I honestly can say I don't think that I've ever heard anything like it, and it's really fascinating. But let's take a quick trip to Woodstock, Vermont to visit a lovely cemetery I saw about a month ago. Welcome to Cemetery Tripping, where I will feature a different cemetery in each episode that I hope you will seek out and enjoy as much as I do. As an avid taphophile, or lover of tombstones, I spend a lot of time in the local New England area in the beautiful and historic cemeteries we have here. The stones here are like no others, and I have literally thousands of pictures of the intricate and symbolic carvings found on them. You can see my pictures on Facebook by doing a search for Cemetery Tripping. I recently visited a friend in Woodstock, Vermont, who showed me many wonderful cemeteries in the area. One of them was River Street Cemetery, located just out of the center of the historic and picturesque downtown. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the incorporation date for the cemetery, but the graves seemed to be late 1700s to present day. There were many beautiful carvings immediately visible, including a plethora of pointing fingers, little lambs, birds, and of course, willow and urn motifs. I was particularly taken with a swirled willow style of carving that I saw a few times in this cemetery, and it was something I hadn't run across before. River Street is also the final resting place of many prominent people, including two Vermont governors, Julius Converse and Peter Thatcher Washburn, two congressmen, Charles Marsh and Andrew Tracy, U.S. Senator Jacob Collamer, actors Maude Durbin and her husband Otis Skinner, and American Civil War Medal of Honor recipient Thomas Orville Seaver. This brings us to my favorite gravestone in the cemetery, that of Henry Mower. Henry was the son of Captain Samuel Mower and his third wife, Esther Kittredge Locke. The Mowers were a prestigious local family who made their fortunes providing industrial supplies to the people of Vermont. Henry's gravestone has been cleaned and is well preserved, as are all the stones on this lot, and it is also covered in carvings of fantastic Masonic symbols, including an all-seeing eye in the middle of a cloud, a Masonic star with a G, pillars, an open book, Masonic pavement, ladders, and a bell. In addition, a willow and hourglass have also been added, symbolizing life's end, my glass is run, and rebirth. I also noticed a series of eight grave markers nearby, all standing in a row of small white stones, which told a very sad story. They are all the children of Edwin and Eunice Hutchinson. All died at very young ages. Three infants ranging in age from nine days to two months then four more children who all passed between the ages of one and three. Eunice died on August 1st, 1845, at the young age of 36. My guess is from complications after giving birth two months earlier to her seventh child, a son who died July 19th, 1845. Apparently, Edwin remarried at some point to a much younger woman. However, she also died young at the age of 28. River Street Cemetery is a lovely place to see some great carvings and when you are done you can drive over the covered bridge into the beautiful downtown Woodstock to soak up even more history. That was a great cemetery. Well kept, some great carvings, especially that one at the end. Those are the kind of markers that literally make me jump up and down. And of course, Woodstock is just so pretty and historic anyways. Who wouldn't want to visit it, right? So now let's get back into our new four presentation. I'm sure you'll want to see exactly how all this ends. November 2nd, Robert viewed a seventh-month-old fetus floating in the doorway and a smaller one in the bedroom. Uh, some sort of a, an act was performed on the house, not by a priest. We feel it was a cleansing. No one was allowed in the house during the process. It can't be done on the surrounding grounds or adjacent property. Quote, the past cannot be put to rest. Small lights 
uh, have turned into five-foot balls. Barbara put her hands into one and, and it shattered. Only Barbara could see them. She wasn't afraid. A white beam shot into the attic before we got there. Nothing on film in the attic. November 22nd, we're getting close here. Uh, first night back in the house, this is interesting. She's sleeping with her daughter because she feels something's wrong. Something tugs on the blanket. Okay, Barbara tugs back and places her leg over her daughter. A few seconds later, her leg is pulled off and she falls asleep. The following night, she awakes unable to move but sees a bright white membrane looking substance. A funnel is opening just above. She can look in and sees a great distance. Claims it knows she is looking into the opening and closes up and pulls through the window. She's filled that she's forced to go to sleep. Uh, of interest, a few nights later, she awakes to see a floating eye being held by a hand, and the eye is being cleansed by a tongue. We've never seen anything like this in the data. This, this is crazy stuff. Um, the eye in the hand is about 11 inches wide by 5 inches high, and it flies away. She wakes. She can't move. She feels she's never alone, always being watched. Then there's a very large wolf in their yard viewed two times. He sat up and watched, and after a few minutes, she feels it's not related. The wolf just left. Okay, I'm almost done, I promise. December, 95. All right, not much activity on the first floor. 90% of the activity is in the bedroom. Lots of symbols and figures on a plate. Barbara can only move her eyes. She sees a baby's head on the wall, no fear, just watched it for about a minute, awakes at 3 o'clock in the morning to see a cluster of symbols and figures on the ceiling. They seem to be moving in and out of each other and rotating. It seems to be on a ribbon, all or about four inches high. Also, later in that a.m. evening, a lot of activity in the shape of beams and squares and sparkles. Above in the attic, Sounds of somebody throwing pebbles onto the floor. She made note of that. All right, uh, December 5th, Greg and I had a visit with uh, Lorraine, my friend, who cousin who's a psychic. The house was cleansed. Lorraine did an interpretation. We don't have time for it. Um, there's an interpretation, interpretation. July 2nd, we're almost done. Show RR. Barbara's been living out of the state for a while. Her husband is still living in the house and is trying to get Barbara and the kids to move back home. He feels that the evil energy has total control over him and still has fears that the evil at the house will get to her. Continues to see E.T. type beings and feels that they are there to protect her and won't harm her. If E.T.'s have to wake her, they shine a beam of light into her eyes. It hurts for a few seconds. Then she views a silver bar. Do we have that slide? There's a silver bar there someplace. We'll find it. Uh, it hovers outside the window. Then a bar moves into the glass and comes into the room. The bar's about 18 inches in length. It seems to have helped her on bad nights. Here's the bar we're talking about. And uh, multiple colors enters the room through the half window foyer. So the window is here, it's got an upper window, half moon, and in the window is a bar. And the bar is shown at the very top of the screen. Now there's other stuff happening, I'm not even going to get into it. Uh, <clears throat> now a transparent box, two feet by two feet, or square almost, flies around the bedroom. She's only seen this once and appears outside of her daughter's room. The half circle window just hovering then shoots straight away. Barbara feels it's connected to her and the children. Uh, the great room, which they're all hunkered down in, has been full of white 10-foot ET beings, maybe taller. On this particular evening, all slept in the daughter's room. Feels that the daughter wasn't bothered by evil forces and so forth. Daughter had a convulsion last night. Knew that this was last night in the house or she would lose her daughter. Those are her words. She would lose her daughter. Three stars came down from the sky and played together, shooting beams at each other and changed places every now and then. 
They connect through a beam in her eye. She sees two small beams in a ship in the bedroom. The ship is square, brownish in color. The two beams were busy working inside on a panel. Each beam was about four foot tall. Slight figure, she was not fearful. The square ship is about five feet by five feet next to the daughter's play horse, hovering two to three feet off the floor. Barbara is leaving the house and wants to meet with me and Lorraine when she returns. She thanked me for everything we've done. She indicated that this would probably be our last correspondence. Her marriage was failing. Her husband, who was an attorney, ordered us to stay away. The last thing I want to show and Greg takes over is pictures of the kids, uh, her daughter on the floor. Now, his, it's easy to look at something and say lens glare. Well, we said maybe that's lens glare. This came through the window. Next slide. Her daughter. The actual image taken form, the energy field, and then she was smart enough to take a picture behind her daughter. Next one. And you can see the daughter with the balloons holding it. All cases coming to an end, frustrating that we can't come to summary conclusions, but this one was all over the place. Now the fun part. So let me just back up a second because you've heard a lot of details. And I hope you're as confused as I am, and maybe you have some suggestions. So, 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 is it paranormal? Kinda. Are there aliens involved? Maybe. What other stuff is going on? So if we back up a second, let's just think about this. We weren't the first ones to be invited to this case. There were Native Americans, and they did smudge ceremonies. There was an exorcism. There were psychics who came, some from MIT that brought equipment with them to try to find, to understand what cold spots in the house were, were all about. And um, see, oh, a, a physician came because they didn't, they didn't feel well. So, so we were like the caboose of the train. We weren't at the front of the train. By the time we got there, oh, so, so let me just mention this. Sudbury, the town of Sudbury, is a fairly well-developed town. In the area in question, there are no houses. In 1994, there were no houses. There's lots of hills in Sudbury. This was a low hill, and it was right near the Sudbury River. There were no houses on this hill at all. The couple comes from New York, and suddenly a, a giant house is built on this hill. The house was so large, they had to cut a notch out of the hill to level enough of it to build a house. When we finally got involved in this, this big house was essentially empty, except for one of the eight bedrooms upstairs in a wing. Um, it's like a, a motel, you know, this, this hallway. And one of these bedrooms, is where the whole family was living. They were, the, the grandparents, Barbara, her kids, everybody was in this one room. And when you went in the room, they had this couch they were using to barricade the door. Can you imagine how stressed they were? And then the story starts to unfold. We didn't know where to go with this except listen to the, to the, to their testimony and take it as best as we could. I think that somehow, they, it's, it's, is it possible, let me ask, is it possible they disturbed mm -hmm. something in this area which triggered a lot of events, some of which were described as alien, some of which were described as paranormal, some of which I'm gonna talk about related to the, to the, uh, the site itself. It turns out Sudbury has a rich history and the and and what triggered the, what I'm about to talk about is when Barbara's ch uh, daughter and her friends were downstairs in the playroom one night, they came screaming up to their mom and said, "Mommy, some men just in in un, in clothing we don't recognize, and their faces are painted." just ran by the playroom window in the dark. Lots of them. And it freaked them out. I'm not sure that this didn't happen more than once. 
Barbara never saw anything, but the kids did. So when we were there one day, near the end of our investigations, I think Joe mentioned, we walked out of the house down a path into the swampy area behind the house because this hill was tucked up right against the Sudbury River and, and the swamp that the river made up. And, and we met a guy living in a rack sh shamble hut. Let me, just, let me just put together in context, remember I said there's, Sudbury has a long history. And if you go down Route 20, right near this house, you will see a sign that says, Entering King Phillips District. And then about a quarter mile farther, you'll see, Exiting King Phillips District. And I said to myself at the time, I had sort of heard about King Philip, but I didn't really know the history. And when I started digging into it, I realized that this house in question is right in this area called King Philip's District. And what is that story? So let me show you how I think there's a connection to that and this house and the fact that it was a new construction in an area that there were never any houses built before. So let me back up in time, really back up. On June 8, 1675, three local Native Americans were, were hanged in Plymouth, Massachusetts for the murder of a fellow Wampanoag tribe member named Sassum, Sassman. Two of the people who were hung died. But one of them, who happened to be the son of one of the fellows who died, the rope broke and he fell on the ground. He was still alive. And he claimed his innocence again before the people in Plymouth. Well, it turns out that in 17th century English law, you're allowed to spare somebody if the execution fails and they claim their innocence. So they did. These hangings occurred because the, in the Native American that they killed had brought word of war preparations to the governor of the Plymouth Colony about the other Native Americans living in the area. This was during a time of extreme tensions between the Native Americans and the colonists because unfortunately, as the colonies expanded into this land, the Native Americans were feeling encroached upon. And ironically, a lot of it had to do with cows. Would you believe that the colonists were raising cows and the Indians' fields were being eaten by the cows, the corn and the things that they were growing? Medicom was the chief of the tribe of, of the Wampanoags at that time. Guess what his nickname was? King Philip. King Philip. This was a name he gave himself because this was a way that the Indians interacted with the colonists by giving themselves names that the colonists could relate to. His father, Medicon's father, was Massasoit. He was the guy who saved the Mayflower pilgrims from death the first winter they were here. His son, Medicom, King Philip, was now furious that these Native Americans had been murdered from his point of view. He declared, well, he'd been gathering weapons, just like Sassoon had said, because there were these struggles going on between everyone. And he declared war as he had been planning to, using this as the trigger. So now we have the father saves them, and in the same generation, the son declares war on, them, on the colonists. What a mess. During the next six months, when King Philip moved into New England, he joined up with the Nipmucks. The Nipmucks were in this area. And he, he had as many as 2,000 warriors together at one time. They filled the Connecticut Valley with the smoke of torched villages. They burned and slaughtered colonial communities like Framingham, Sudbury, Marlborough, Hudson, all the places around here. On April 21st, 1676, he brought 300 warriors down to Sudbury. When he came to Sudbury that night, we believe, I believe that he came 
down the west side of the Sudbury River and then east into Sudbury, right over the hill where this house was built on the night of April 21st, 1776. And it's possible that's what the children were seeing because somehow maybe there was a, a tear in time. The historical details that I just gave, I think the context of the unusual events that were the, of our investigation in 1994, while reviewing accounts of the case, it seemed like there's some, some relationship with the fact that this was a new house on an old hill disturbing something. And when the daughter and her friends saw people running by the windows at night, I think they could possibly have been these Indians on their way to Green Hill. We took a walk into the woods when we were at the house and we came upon a dilapidated old wooden hut. A grizzled elderly recluse came out of the house and I spoke to him. He'd been living in the swamp for many years. Everybody in the community knew him. His name was David. And he says to me, I point to the house, the new house. And he says, oh, they shouldn't have built that house there. And I tried to, to get him to explain to me why he said that. And I could tell that he was very reticent, very reluctant, and very uneasy, and very uncomfortable. And he just walked away into the swamp and disappeared. <laughs> Joe and I finally went back to the house. You know, had David, during his long tenure in the swamp, seen something on that hill that, that was related to what the children had seen in the playroom of the house that disturbed the hill? that the Indians, that Native Americans used to live on, you know? This brings us to the central unresolved question of, from my point of view, is what did the little girl and her friends in the Sudbury House see on that, ni uh, uh, on that 1990, 1994? Did they experience what's known as a time slip? And if you go online and read about Versailles, there's a famous case in Versailles where people saw people walking around in 18th century garb, but in fact, it was 1911. Well, was this another one? Was this a time slip? Did the figures the children reported seeing outside the window in the suburb house coexist with the present in a form of ceremonial time connecting 1676 and 1994? I just wanted to say that my wife often says of these investigations, they end up being murky and unresolved, and yet it seems Still, a fascinating and poignant enigma may have involved a moment forever present, both tragic and pivotal in American history, regarding this house. What do you think? I don't know. There's a ton more information. We just didn't have time for time. Ron wouldn't give us too well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Anyways, you can always reach them. They'll be outside walking around. Right. right. Thank, right. You. Thank you. Thanks very much. Wow. So how crazy was that? The level of dedication of Greg and Joe to unravel everything that happened in Sudbury really leaves me in awe. And even though we may never really and truly know why or how any of it happened, it was certainly a thought-provoking case. But isn't that really the very nature of the paranormal and what attracts us all to it? We'll never really know if we have the right answers but we sure enjoy trying to find them. So that wraps up tonight's show. I'll see you again next month, hopefully with Van Helsing. But anyways, until then, stay safe, be well, and please wear a mask. Let's get out of the woods with this stuff so I can see all your smiling faces in person again. Bye. Take care.
from goalies to ghosties, long leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night. Deliver us, good Lord.